into a dojo. A dojo has got its set of rules. Sure. And, and when you enter a space, you can then change that space. Adding music to a dojo will completely change the space. Your presence and who you are stepping in and your energy levels will change the space. So there's this constant connection with everything around you and how you enter a place and how you react to whatever is being presented to you can dictate the way things are going to go. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Corey martin Jewel. Corey, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I, we, our pre-show chat, if we want to call it that, I, I know we're getting into some cool stuff. Uh, audience, you know what? I'm not even going to tell you. I'm not even going to tell you the things that this man has worked on, and I'm pumped. But before we get there, remember, Whistlekick is here to serve the traditional martial arts community. We are here to connect, educate, and entertain all of you out there, no matter what you do, no matter where you are, because we believe that training for just six months changes people. And if the more people we can change, the more we can change the world. So your support in that means a lot to us. Lots of ways you can support us. Check out whistlekick.com. Check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the, everything related to this episode and the other episodes we've done. And a special shout out to Kataro for sponsoring this episode. K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. Everything from the world's best martial arts belts to some fun apparel, belt bags, keychains. They print custom certificates. If you haven't checked out what they've done recently, because they're adding stuff just like we do, they add stuff all the time, please do. Kataro.com and use the code WK10 to save 10% on your first order. Thank you again to Kataro. But Corey, thank you for being here and joining us on Martial Arts Radio. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. I'm really yeah. excited to share. Yeah. Yeah, th this is this is going to be fun. And we should acknowledge first off, because you, 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 you said two things before we got here, that you're in New Zealand and it's 8 a.m. and you're not a morning person. Yeah, I, I, I so, really, uh, I'm a night owl and I get a lot done at night. So um, yeah. But yeah, we're on the other sides of the world. And yeah. Um, <laughs> pretty exciting times that we can do this. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is cool. It's, it wasn't that long ago. We wouldn't have been able to do this, right? We would have been emailing yeah. back and forth and said, okay, when are, when are you going to be here? When am I going to be there? And, you know, kind of figuratively holding our, our calendars up to each other, looking for that intersection. But now with technology, we can, yeah, we can, as long as we can make the time zone stuff work, we can talk to anybody. Exactly. And the streaming is just so fast now. I mean, we're on islands. When I'm not here in New Zealand, I'm in Hawaii. And the it's just amazing. You can be in some of the most remote places in the world and still have access to everybody. So it's, yeah. it's really a gift. Yeah. And, and now with uh, various satellite internet, you know, Starlink, et, et cetera, mm -hmm. even those areas that maybe they weren't so good, now you can do it there too. And from what I hear, Starlink's pretty good. Yeah, did you see the robots that uh, Tesla just came out with? I was thinking those would be some great sparring partners. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, you seen the show How I Met Your Mother? Uh, no, I haven't actually. Okay, I haven't okay, yet. great show, great show. Um, and actually, we we've talked about it on this show a couple times before because it was from a lot of conver a, uh, a recurring sub theme in that show that the world really got ready for Cobra Kai, hmm. which is, which is kind of fun. So if you're at all a fan of, of that series, go watch, but there, there's something that comes up a couple times in that show, robots versus wrestlers. Oh, yeah. and it's always made me wonder. So it's fun that you bring it up. What would it be like if we had robot sparring partners? You know, we'd have, we'd certainly have to throttle it down because I don't know about you, but I have a hard time kicking wood, let alone kicking metal <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah. carbon fiber plastic. I don't want to break my shins. Sure. But for targeting and, and finding, yeah. you know, spots and, and making sure it's, you know, getting the timing. And yeah. You could just do some simple things that you wouldn't have to, you know, have your hand up, like usually with the, with the human, you know, and you could really get in there. Those right. things were coming to mind when the guy was pouring the, all the, all the little TikTok videos I saw from the, from the Elon yeah. party. Yeah. It'll be really, really cool. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. see. Maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can partner with Tesla and make our, make yeah. a, a whistle kick Tesla sparring partner. Yeah. Uh, Elon, if you're watching, let me know. We'll, we'll make it happen. 
you're going to have to do all the work. I'll just put a sticker on it. That's about all I'll be able to contribute to that. I'm sure he'd be down with it. He seems like a really cool guy. He does. He does. Yeah. All right. So let, let's start here because you said Hawaii, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before you're American. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does one end up on the other side of the world and seemingly uh, uh, hone in on islands as places of residence? Yeah. Well, my dad was in the, uh, the Navy, the U.S. Navy, and so we've always lived near water, and I've just kind of mm. gravitated towards places that were warm and tropical and water. So I grew up in Florida, um, started martial arts in Florida. Um, I then moved to Virginia, Italy, and Spain. Then I got into filmmaking, um, and that set me off on my journeys around the world to New Zealand, working on Lord of the Rings, King Kong, Avatar. Uh, California, I worked on the Matrix. So anywhere there's a beach or, you know, technology and martial arts, I've, I've tried to get involved. And then I moved to Hawaii after California. I always wanted, I was born there and I always wanted to move back when I retired because it's very expensive mm. there. But at some point, you know, life just worked out in a way where I was like, what am I waiting for? Let me just go do what I want to do now and mm. let it work out. And it, and it has. So every now and then I, I do have to leave Hawaii. Like I came down recently to New Zealand to uh, work for a couple months and uh, then I'll be going back and enjoying. But yeah, so I've been very fortunate to be able to, to, to live in some really great places. And um, you learn a lot when you, when you live in different sure. cultures and different places, as well sure. as, you know, visiting China and, and uh, other countries just purely for martial arts. Yeah. 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 You know, you, you, you mentioned some films that I love, you know, the, the, the matrix franchise, I, I think is wonderful. We've had some folks that have been part of that from from the stunt side on the show and you know to me lord of the rings is, is probably the best example of cinematic storytelling mm. that that in my opinion right like i mean some people might go to head head with me on on star wars but you know I, I think lord of the rings does it better but there's still there's combat in there right show me a great story that doesn't have some combat that doesn't have something that's at least martial arts adjacent. Yeah, definitely. And um, the great thing about those films in particular is they really got into the worlds. Like if you go into Agent Smith, he fights robotical. Mm -hmm. If you go into the other characters, Neo is more fluid. You get into the elves, they have their own systematic style of fighting versus the Urukai and the orcs. And it's all been very well thought out and choreographed. And, you know, that's really as a martial artist, it's exciting to see the different mm. types of styles and stuff because that's an expression of their culture, even though it's a made up culture. Right. But even in the past, in the seventies, like you'd watch some of those seventies films and, you know, we kind of write them off cause it was pre Bruce Lee and it wasn't very effective looking, but they were showcasing. Like if you went on an Eagle style, let's say, they, you were watching Eagle for the first time. So the guy was doing as many moves as possible to demonstrate what this was about more so than this is how I'm going to, you know, beat my opponent. And so when you look at it that way, then you can appreciate it. But now it's more like MMA and stuff, and it's very combat effective oriented instead mm -hmm. of a showcase. And so it's cool when you see like multiple fights, like in the matrix, when Neo gets better and better and better and better, you can see his development and, 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 and just the, uh, you know, the growth of the character, not just as a, as a character, but as a fighter and as he gets better and, and to see that play out, it's, it's very cool to watch when you start looking for those subtle details. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, I think I need to ask, you're mm -hmm. involved in films. What is your role? Are you working? Because you clearly spoke with a lot of passion about that, that aspect, things that a lot of people aren't even going to notice in mm -hmm fight choreo. So is that where you're working on films? Uh, no, I really got into the fight choreography when I started doing my own um, okay. film. Um, but when I was young, and uh, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. When I was yeah, young please. in Florida, um, I first started martial arts when I was about six or seven in a Korean style called Tang Soo Do. Mm -hmm. And after we left, as I said, we were in the military, we moved quite a bit. I could never find another similar style. There was Taekwondo mm. and these other things, but some of the countries we moved to, there, there wasn't anything I felt comfortable doing. Um, but once I got back to California, I was working on the Matrix film as a visual effects artist. That's, that's the role that I usually do on, in films. 
And that's towards the end of the film where we're adding the characters with whatever's fake or removing the backgrounds, making it all look seamless. And every day, uh, just for fun, you know, you, we could see clips of Dragon and the other choreographers doing stuff of the fight scenes. And, you know, you have to look at them for reference if you were going to make Agent Smith. I worked on more of the battle stuff than the, than the Neo Smith fights, but I would still watch that stuff every day. And it was very inspiring. And so you're seeing, you know, let, let, me, let me try a triple spin instead of a double mm -hmm. spin. And you're seeing them work this stuff out and it's all captured there on video. And I'm like, I got to get back out and start moving. So I went back down the street. I found a martial arts school, picked it back up and started learning Kempo and um, mm. Kung Fu. And so that's where I began my journey to a black belt again. Um, but yeah, that's where it came from. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm on the technical end, but I really love choreography and I'm, I'm not on set with those guys, but we get to see that stuff all the time. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really inspiring. Nice. So, so, you know, here we have yet another example of martial arts in movies, getting people to train, but, mm. you know, in a slightly different way. I don't, I don't know that we've, we've had anybody that was working on the movie on the editing side, on the, on the effects side. We've had, we've had actors who went, wow, I, I, I like this. I want to, I want to go deeper on it, mm. but cool. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Like, uh, even when I was a boy, like we did, like I was saying, Tang Sudo, and the teacher there was very good. Like, I liked playing baseball and soccer, but I didn't really gravitate towards it. The thing about martial arts was that all the time you were engaged. Like, in baseball, mm -hmm. you only got to bat once every once in a while. <laughs> and then soccer, sometimes the ball was way over there. Um, but in karate, you were always on, like, yeah. all the whole class. And so, that was really great for me, but it wasn't until I saw the karate kid in the theaters when it came out and they took us all, you know, the whole school, we got tickets, we went to see it, that I was really like, it took it to another level. And I really, you know, Mr. Miyagi and the okay. philosophy and all the stuff that goes behind what we're doing. We're not just punching and kicking. Like what is the purpose here? And, um, that personal journey that people go through and then enlightenment and we can go through all that. Um, however far we want to go but um that is the real juice you know and the, the the hook is the the action like oh look check that out check that move out check this out that was amazing but then as you develop personally the the real juice is, is in the other things that that aren't seen on screen yeah mm -hmm. from my my personal take yeah, yeah yeah no i'm 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 with you i'm absolutely with you there so you start training in kempo Mm -hmm. And of course, California is a, is a hotbed of Kempo. Mm -hmm. And how long had you, had you been out of training? Um, probably 15 years. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so it's a while. Yeah. yeah it was a, a while. while. Yeah. yeah. What was it like going back? It was uh, a kind of a breath of fresh air at first yeah. um, because a lot of things just came back that were muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also got to see how much I, I was going to be able to grow. Like when I was young, I couldn't understand the differences in soft style and Kempo. And we began with Shotokan, which was extremely rigid. And yeah. um, they want you to start with the basics. And so it was fun to just lock those punches out again, get into that horse stance and um, just exercise like that primal, you know, here in New Zealand, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the rugby team, they do that haka at the beginning yeah and actually. they really get into it. And it's a really good expression of, of I'll say positive uh, aggression. Um, and in our culture, we don't have any outlets like that. And so to mm. be able to go from behind my desk where I was working out, you know, physically clicking a mouse and uh, making cool stuff to be able to physically exert myself in a positive way way was was very invigorating and, and, and um it feels great i mean that's mm. the bottom line because you feel great every time you walk out of the school you feel great yeah yeah so that that was my initial i was like oh i'm back you know here we go yeah and you know you're 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 training kempo you're feeling good uh -huh. and how long 
I mean, obviously you've, you've left there physically because you, you're physically not there, but how long were you training in that school? Uh, I was training there for about seven, seven to eight years. Um, okay. It starts with uh, Shotokan, like I was saying, and then you move into uh, Kempo, which is hard soft. And then oh, you this is the same school. Same school, yeah. They call okay, it. Okay, I, I, I missed yeah. something in there. Okay, you, you yeah. did say that, but it didn't, it didn't land. The yeah, same so school is, is taking you through a mm -hmm. multi-style progression. Interesting. Yes. yes, and so the the final step would be five animals of kung fu. Um, we did tiger, snake, crane, dragon, and panther or leopard. Um, okay. They're about they're very similar, and um, yeah, so that was a, a full journey, and then that's you know the physical aspects but you also have the um as you start working out more you have to change your diet um you know it's up to you how far you want to go but you start cleaning your body out um and then the school never got into anything spiritual like they pretty much stripped it and i don't know if that's um, a result of you know the lineage of the people that that we learned mm -hmm. from kind of went from uh, what Matosi to William Chow to Ed Parker. And then he, he put the belts in and then it became very systematized. So the people that we learned from came from that lineage. And so things were very systematic. Um, but there's a deeper spiritual element that just kind of starts to happen as you work out and as you do katas and you start to understand, um, the way you feel when you do a kata, after you've done it right, it's kind of, I don't know if anybody's golfed, but you hit the golf, you know, you hit it just right. And then you you get addicted to this present moment oneness uh, sensation that you can't put your finger on when you're, you're first training, because none of that was discussed with me. It was just, these are the moves. This is what you do, but this stuff starts happening. And then your body's cleaning out. Um, you have to change your diet at some point because you're working out for so long that in order to just be able to continue to train at a level that you want to be at, you need to incorporate new things. And then you start to learn, hang on a minute, what I'm putting into my body has a tremendous effect on the way I feel and the way I'm able to perform. And so that became a, a journey for me as well, seeing different things. And at the moment, um, I'm a raw foodist, um, plant-based. Mm. But I did go for a year entirely on meat. I was eating eggs and boiled steak just for the protein. That was what the guidance was. And then I started asking myself, you know, the Shaolin monks are completely vegetarian. Do I need this meat? Like my dad's dad passed on from a heart attack. Is there another way to do this? And you get to go through the experience yourself of, let me try this and see how I feel. Has this affecting my performance in the martial arts? Mm. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of um, of learning, a, a broad spectrum of things that you just, when you go in the door thinking you're going to do some punching and kicking and kicking, but it, 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 you just come out the other end a completely different uh, person. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you mentioned that this this school in California, you know, mm -hmm. you, you felt it kind of removed what you're calling the spiritual aspects of training. Mm -hmm. So where where did you get that? Was it a personal journey. You said, wait a second, there's something here or, or was it another yeah. school that introduced that to you? No, it was uh, intuitive. Um, just, I'm going to say the emotions themselves maybe had something to do with the way that mm -hmm. your body awakens, um, uh, combined with the cleaner diet. Um, I was able, I was more clear, mm. um, but doing katas, you know, a lot of times people, uh, poo poo katas because they're not physical enough or combative enough, but um, not me. Okay, awesome. No, the, not the me. Emotions themselves. Um, it, there's a there's a particular style in China called uh, grasping higher consciousness. Xin Yi Ba, I think I, I'm maybe not pronouncing it correctly. But if you watch the guys, they have a extremely winding, twisting motions, hmm. and they're basically bringing themselves out like a squeegee. Um, the motions themselves um, and the fluidity of it is unlocking your chi meridians. And um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've gone a long way through healing as well. Once you learn to destroy the body, then you start to learn to heal the body. And I believe that the twisting motions in those katas was actually awakening some sort of, much like a meditation, um, a deeper awareness. And then you 
feel that connection when you're done with the kata, you feel like a million bucks. You're like, you don't really know what's going on, but every time you do that, you just keep going back to, I want to feel good. Let me go through that again. And you, you, then you start to learn a little bit that it's connected to your mind and your mindset. Um, but all those spiritual elements came full circle at the end after my black belt. I went to the Amazon jungle and I studied with some shamans there and they taught me some shamanism and shamanism. Um, if you look it up in Wikipedia, it's um, one of the most primal religions, they call it, but it's really, uh, I'd almost call it close to Star Wars, um, where you are connecting um, and defining spaces and you're actually fighting, but it's entirely mental. And um, mm. yeah, so you, you begin to train your mind in, in um, defining spaces. And when I say space, I mean the area around you, like the space I'm in yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hope I'm not cutting you off, but no, I, okay. I want to go back okay. because on, yeah. you, you, you presented the idea that, oh, I earned my black belt. And then I went and I lived in the Amazon mm -hmm. as if that is a thing that people do trivially. Hmm. Um, and they don't, <laughs> I mean, yeah, unless yeah. you're running in way different circles than I am, how does that happen? Yeah. Um, so I got to the end, um, towards the end of my black belt and there's this movie that my teacher showed me called circle of iron. And I don't know if you've seen it. It's one of the mm -hmm. last Bruce Lee films and, okay. um, it was made after Bruce Lee died. And in this film at the end, of, he looks into a book and, um, he has to make this decision if he's going to stay with the martial arts group or if he's going to go out into the world and train on his own. Mm. And um, this looking into the book, he sees his own reflection. And, and that's the same as the Dragon Scroll and Kung Fu Panda. It's the same in the new Karate Kid when he looks into the, the dragon pool. Um, so I was given this choice of am I going to stay with the school or am I going to um, go off into the world and teach? Mm. And there was a relationship involved as well. I don't really want to get into it with, uh, with someone else. And sure, um, sure. that was not going the way uh, I had anticipated. And so physically um, I needed some healing yeah. and uh, I was looking into just synchronistically. I was working um, with some friends. Uh, they were at, uh, at ILM at Lucas and they saw this documentary about these shamans in the Amazon. And this documentary needed visual effects done on it to sh demonstrate what was going on. And I was looking at this and I was going, holy cow, if what this is, is, is true, this is the, the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I need to check this out. So I got on a plane and I went to the Amazon and that's when I, I met the shaman. There was a Western shaman there who had been training with indigenous people. So he was able to kind of be a liaison between their the different worlds because it's a completely different world their their fundamentals are completely different um and so that healing process um is what opened me up to my next stage of training so in a way some of our biggest obstacles become you know guideposts or something to a new direction and that that that's that was the connection there yeah hmm. cool and how long were you there um, I went multiple times. I didn't stay there, um, but uh, I went I've probably been six or seven times. And um, yeah, for, you know, you go for several weeks and you go through a pretty intensive, um, well, it's a combination of ceremonies and, and your own personal process of, of unwinding and, um, and growing uh, personal development. And at that point, you know, I will say that martial arts is very, very empowering on a personal development level. Mm -hmm. Like you become a better person and the shamanism breaks you out into uh, more of a, a global, uh, not global, but a larger consciousness where you no longer are um, concerned with your own personal development. It's more of a, uh, it's bigger than that. So mm -hmm. you are um, you're opening yourself up to, to more. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So it seemed like a logical next step and that led into the healing, which took me to Wudang and, and, um, I started learning some, the, uh, traditional Chinese medicine and being able to see that, you know, and, uh, you were talking about earlier, um, the, the way the things were stripped out. And a lot of it yeah. was the reasons for that were because it wasn't understood and 
you didn't want to come across as woo woo or talking about stuff that you didn't have any experience about. So whenever I talk about things, it's all from personal experience. So I didn't believe in chi. I didn't believe in any of these concepts until I actually physically um, was able to feel them and, and, and experience them. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, as, as Westerners, we are kind of raised in a, a, a at least loosely scientific approach. Even those of us that were, that are raised in very religious households have a very, you know, cause and effect. I don't believe until I see it sort of mindset. And I, 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 th I think, I think you're right. I think a lot of martial arts schools, even the instructors that have some of these ideas, you know, and I'll include myself in there. I don't, I don't talk to my, my students about this stuff early on. And granted my, my school's new. So, you know, I don't have anybody that's been training with me 10, 20 years. So, you know, maybe I would as they get further along, but I think that's because we, it's difficult for students to understand certain things that require context until they have the context, mm -hmm. right? Until they've been through this stuff, you can say it, they can hear it, they can even believe it, but do they get it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then you get somebody that maybe doesn't fully get it and then they go off and they teach and they don't have that aspect. And I, I think that's a lot of what happened as martial arts were brought to the West post-World War II. A lot of those people were training a year or two. They understood the moves. Mm -hmm but did they understand the deeper meaning? Yeah. And I think that deeper meaning is, is kind of starting to see the light of day now. I mean, it's in a lot of the films. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what I'm trying to share, you know, with the film that I'm working on as well is getting the deeper concepts across because mm -hmm. the, like we were talking about earlier, the, the punching and kicking is the, the hook. Like if you're into yoga, like you are already gravitating towards something kind of spiritual, but, people that are gravitating towards martial arts aren't going to martial arts to learn how to meditate. That's the last thing on their mind. They want to go kick butt, yeah. feel good, develop themselves. And it's a, it's the same thing though. It's, it's the way the universe is reaching out and connecting with you on a level that you're ready for to pull you mm -hmm. on the same journey. And we're all going on this same journey, which is returning to the core of who we all really are. And, um, I, I can't, I can put it in some different terms, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, turn off the audience at all <laughs> with uh, any preconceived notions is really what it is because it's a stripping away of, of our concepts of, of what we think it is and, and then opening up to a bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 at some point when you look at at least my understanding of all the religions that I understand, right, which is not certainly not all of them and definitely not even most of them at a deep level. But through all of them, it does mirror martial arts training in that as you get further, you have to put aside some things, you have to cultivate some vulnerability, and you get to a certain point and you realize there is connection. And, and, and I think, you know, if you look at Maslow's pyramid, I think that that's what a lot in the West would call self-actualization. It's that, that not just logical belief, but that, that entrenched understanding that we are all connected mm. and martial arts. I mean, from, from, for me, I'm more comfortable being vulnerable because I know I have a backup plan, mm. right? Whether that is physical or emotional or whatever. And I, I, I think that that is something that others feel as well. Yeah. You, you, you have a grounding and something yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah. And that's something that, that you build as through your, uh, you know, well, from my own point, building through like boxing and, and being in the ring and sparring and taking the punches and, and learning that, you know, Hey, I'm still here. I'm okay. Even though I just lost. And there's a lot of losing in martial arts, which develops you into overcoming. And then from overcoming, eventually you find that you're just really fighting yourself this whole time you have been fighting yourself. And when you come to mm -hmm. the piece of that, then you're like rounded in, you know, everything's going to be okay regardless. And then, you know, people ask, do I still physically train? And it's like, I don't feel the need to be able to protect myself in that way. It's all going to come out when it needs to, but mm. the training has become mental. So with the 
to connect back to the shamanism, you start defining your space. And if someone comes up to me and is uh, aggressive or whatever, you can dispel that. You can feel the energy that they're coming with. You can work it. You can move it. You can make a joke about it. There are so many ways to deal with it besides going toe to toe. And that's just really uh, to have that toolkit is just amazing to be able to um, avoid confrontation that's unnecessary and to spend more time feeling joy and happiness and uplifting those people as they come to you that have these things because everybody's got a thing that they uh, a trauma or something that hits somebody in their life that they have got to then overcome or it's going to wreck yeah. them and so as martial artists we learn to overcome those but many people are still on the journey of learning to overcome and you know we're here for those people to help them to to be their best. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you, you've mentioned it a couple times. We, we've got to talk about it. Movie? You're working on a movie? Tell us about this movie. Yeah. Um, so after Avatar, um, I watched, uh, when we were working on Avatar, we got to see the entire low quality version of the film before it was made. And so we'd watch it every day and James Cameron would say, hey, make it look like this. He would constantly reference the low quality version mm -hmm. he did. So in 2005, uh, I, was, I, I wrote a script for a film that was going to teach kids. Um, but there was another film called Kung Fu Panda being made at the same time. And so I could never get my film funded. And mm. so I took it upon myself. Because it, was, sim because it was seen similar, as yeah. too similar? Yeah, yeah. And I would have our arguments, you know, like, hey, you know, there's Deep Impact. And um, there was another movie, Armageddon, at the same time. There's lots of similar competing movies, A Bug's Life and Ants. You know, they were coming out. Like, let's do that. Yeah. You know, we can have two. There's more than enough. Um, and right. the, the plan was in 2008, well, the Beijing Olympics, everything was about China. And it was right. the perfect time to launch. But the Kung Fu Panda budget was so massive compared to what they were willing to fund for mine. They didn't feel that it was a worthwhile adventure. It was good business sense not to make it. But it left me hanging. So I eventually took it upon myself to make the film myself because it's really hard to get someone to read a script. Mm. Um, and so in 2010, um, after watching Avatar and seeing this low quality previews, that got me inspired to make an entire film on my own at low quality. And um, I motion captured the whole thing. I put on the dot suit for people who don't know what motion oh, capture cool. is. Yeah. And I choreographed all the fight scenes. I played all the characters. Oh, and I got a really great team of actors uh, to come into the sound booth and they voiced the characters and that really brought the, their own, uh, each, each person's individuality mm -hmm. to the character because I, I couldn't possibly embody every character um, if I had to create it myself. Like you see um, Andy Serkis and, and people like in um, King Kong and Planet of the Apes where they really are giving the performance live, like right there, right. They're, they're creating the character. But for me, I was listening um, through speakers that were replaying the actors' voices from the sound recording. And then I would embody the character if it was a big character or, or, um, and, or the choreographing. Um, I would design the fight scenes. And I pretty much just created this entire film. And it's, uh, it's a deep martial arts experience that takes someone on the full journey that, that I went on um, from wow. you know, white belt to black belt. And, uh, but it's entertaining. It's not like a, a documentary, but it goes deep. Like a lot of the things that are glossed over in films, like, uh, we get to you know, the Rocky moment of overcoming, you know, uh, pretty early on in the film. And then from there you go through the destruction and the recreation of the self and the deeper, the deeper connections to everything around you. We get into all that, which is a lot of the stuff in the martial arts that is not imparted to people. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really different film, and um, I'm still looking for funding. It's been incredibly difficult, even though the film's finished at a low quality. Um, it's it's just it's it's an ongoing process. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, is that something that's film. publicly viewable <laughs> or trailer? Yeah, to... okay. yeah, yeah. Um, if you go to our website, uh, whitetigerlegend.com, you can see a trailer. <laughs> And then there's also a link to our book on Amazon, which really goes into a lot more of the details that I couldn't put in the film. So that's all there. For there's a there. there's a book too. Yeah, which which, which came first? Um, the film came first, 
And then okay. when I saw that it was going to take so long for it to be released to the public, I thought this is stuff people need to know now. Mm. So let me put it in a book version. And Harry Potter was big at the time and you know, books were taking off into films. So I thought, you know, Harry Potter's got a lot of dense material in there that, mm. and so let me get it all in there so that people can get the whole Harry thing. Harry Potter proved that kids can handle yeah. substance. Yeah. Yeah. And they can be engaged for, for long yeah. periods of time. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, there's just a lot of deep knowledge in there. I wanted to impart that I couldn't, um, I'm just glossing the surface here, you know, and I feel like I'm mm. all over the place bouncing between the Amazon and China and yeah. Yeah. But it's all in the book. So yeah, people can cool. really get it. Yeah. 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 Oh, awesome. And, and is the, the title of the book the same? Mm -hmm. White Tiger Legend. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah, Tiger Legend. Okay. Amazon, awesome. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll make sure we have links to that in the show notes for, for folks. Yeah. This, uh, this idea, right? This idea that you, you know, you do some training and you take a break and you go in and you go in so deep that you have these stories to tell. And, and what I'm hearing is I, these stories need to be told. Okay. Movie. Okay. That's not going to happen soon. Okay. Book. Right. And I imagine that, it, you know, you've probably considered telling the story in other mediums. Right. Yeah. It, it, I consider myself a storyteller. I'm here helping you tell your story. And, and we've done books. And, and I, I, I wrote a novel with the idea that it would very it could very easily turn into a script. Right. Like I, the choreography for me that, that's read the novel I wrote, you know, that choreography is is right there. Like it works. I was play I was playing it out as I was writing it. Um, have you considered telling your story in other ways? And maybe, maybe it's facetious, but you know, it looks like you're about to answer. I'm not going to cut you off. Go. I, I feel like um, I feel like the film is the way to to okay. show it because it's such a visual medium. Um, the real dense knowledge is in the book as well, but the visual storytelling is what hooked me as a boy. You know, watching mm. Karate Kid and watching The Matrix and all those things that I wanted to to just take that same avenue. And so if, if it doesn't get released as a full feature film, we're considering putting like five minute episodes on mm. uh, YouTube for free and just doing five minutes at a time uh, until we get to the end. And um, that is, that is also a possibility. Um, mm. But yeah, you know, you were talking about choreography and the way that you could see it. It's really fun, you know, to uh, choreograph and figure out like the different fights. If you're in a different, style because we have different animals uh animal styles in the film um mm -hmm. so we have tiger we have crane we have and so to embody each one of those animals um they're not fighting as animals but you know to do the style and to impart like uh, okay now i'm going to be ultra aggressive as a tiger how would i attack someone who's a crane and to play that out in your mind and and to then say okay i've 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 seen a fight but is this telling a story or is it just a showcase and then you, right. you add the other element of story and what is this character's drive? What is, and, and you really create these amazing fights. And so the, the fight scenes aren't just a, a flash, like, okay, now we need to do a fight. Now we need to do a talk and now we need to fight again. It's, it's really a integral part of the story and mm. the character's development. So it's, it's going to be exciting but, for audiences. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm pumped. I, I want to I want to check this out. But you 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 mentioned something that I think is really important. And we think about the best, what I think most people can perceive as the best martial arts films. Mm -hmm. The fight scenes advance the story. They don't they don't break the story. I've heard the same sort of things said about love scenes in mm -hmm. a good Hollywood film versus you know essentially pornography, right? Where it's just mm -hmm. And I think most martial arts films are similar in that way that, yeah, there's a story and, oh, okay, nobody's fought for 20 minutes. We got to have, yeah. uh, we need these two people to be in conflict for some reason. And yeah, those, those fight scenes can be enjoyable, but you're, you're skipping ahead to the quote, good parts. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and, um, that is, uh, a huge part of choreography and, and, and learning from, people in the past. Like I would do a lot of studying, um, like Bruce Lee at mm. the beginning, we were talking about the seventies movies. Um, yeah, you can go back and watch any of those and, and they're showcasing like we were talking about, but then Bruce Lee came in and he was like, okay, I'm going to show the combat effectiveness of this. You know, one kick, one punch is all it's really going to take to take somebody out. 
and and he took everybody out and people were like whoa this is awesome like i want to be able to to do this yeah and then jackie chan came in with his humor and then jet lee came in and jet lee uh, he really incorporated a lot of boxing like he tried to make his his wushu a little bit more combat effective and um and those were amazing films but yeah they were all based on and even the karate kid films like they're all driven by story and so yeah yeah, it's not just superfluous flipping around to flip around yeah no no um you know my and long time members of the audience know my my favorite martial arts film was crouching tiger crouching tiger and dragon is it um the ironically i hate subtitles in movies Mm. but that movie just still has such a special place in my heart and every one of those fight scenes you know for for somebody doesn't understand what we're talking about here the idea that a fight scene can advance a story go watch that Mm -hmm. even if, if you if you don't care try not to care try to mute it and tell me that you don't get through some of those fight scenes and say wait a second I need to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's an advancement here, even through the combat. You, mm. it's it's powerful. Yeah, yeah, it is. You like this? I got to go to China and film at the Shunan Bamboo Sea, which is where Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, oh, all cool. the treetop sequences yeah. where they were filmed. Yeah, it's a massive forest, just all of bamboo and some beautiful lakes. And yeah, yeah, I filmed there for some sequences of our film, and I was shooting background plates. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, we'll that's put the awesome. characters in there later. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. It's so great. China is a massive country. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to go, but there's so many diverse areas. And I would get on the train overnight. And then the next place I would show up in a completely different province. I have to just get out there and film whatever area, whether it was a desert mm. or like the, the, the bamboo sea. And everybody speaks a slightly different language. Everybody was so welcoming. And the, the range of martial arts was, was very different like um mm. i was really surprised um when i went to wudang and stuff like there was amazing stuff going on um and i learned a lot of healing there from teachers but mm. the, the the martial arts it feels like a lot of it actually did flee china and come to america and some of the stuff that i was learning in california some of the styles and the the, the, um, the forms and stuff a lot of that stuff was lost or it's been hidden or it's not there anymore. And um, so that was really surprising to me when I was watching demonstrations was there was amazing skill level and, and, and people. And, um, but the range, the diversity of, of what was being taught was much, much more narrow. Like, yeah. 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 I, I think there's something really interesting. And, and as a, a self-proclaimed nerd, mm-hmm. I really find this to be an exciting aspect of what's going on in martial arts right now, because I think so much of it was, it was a combination of, of hidden and kept back, you know, mm. f- for whatever reasons. But you do that long enough and people start to die off. Mm. And so what you're left with is a lot of people thinking that they have the full context when they don't. But we're in this time now where people are saying, but wait a second. Right. So I come in at it from a from the perspective of anatomy and physiology. Mm. I believe that you don't have to spend a lot of time training to go, wait a second, this is a more efficient way to do this physically. So if we're not doing it this way, why? And I look for that. And there's been a lot of that proven out, you know, with with biomechanics and everything saying, oh, okay. So this tiny little rotation here is meant to engage your lats or whatever it is, right? And I see other people coming at it from different angles with applications within forms or within the spiritual stuff. We've had people on the show who've talked about a variety of these things. And it's so cool to watch Mm. all this rediscovery. Yeah. And that's, that rediscovery is key because you're rediscovering yourself and and, Mm. at at a very core level. And um, yeah, there's so much, um, I don't know if the word's bravado or, or whatnot in the martial arts where you want to pipe up what you've got to be the best. Everybody wants to come from Shaolin. Everybody is a descendant of the man. And, um, and I'm not taking away from anybody, but there is a history of, of, and then when you get to the core of what is really being taught, like even Bruce Lee came back and, you know, he made a lot of people upset, but he was really trying to, 
see the effectiveness like you were talking about, and, you know, and redefining his own style. And it's important to take those things on. And, and that's the fun is, is in that discovery and, and, oh, this, this wrist lock or this twist, or this is really how it goes. And, and yeah, and just making it work for you, you know, because this is about yeah. your own journey and there is tradition and the importance of tradition is, is in having that rote, um, solid foundation to start from, but then you take off from there and, and you bring, you bring the, the next evolution. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the most important question? It's why it's the question that we ask incessantly as children. It's the question that in various forms threads through religions. Mm. And I think within martial arts, and this is something that's really important to me, our training becomes some some boundaries from within which we can safely ask the question why, and it is in asking the question and finding our own answers that that personal growth happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and rediscovery and yeah. finding out who you really are, like, and yeah. asking that question at a deeper and deeper, deeper level, like not who am I as an individual, then who am I as a, you can go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So much deeper, so much mm -hmm. deeper. So you, you, you mentioned, and, and it, you know, I'm sure there are some people out there who dismiss this idea. I'm certainly not one of them, but you mentioned that, uh, your training now is not rooted in physical aspects. It's rooted in, I believe you, you described it as mental aspects. I think that was the word yeah. you used. Okay. Yeah. Can you, yeah. can you just mm -hmm. give us a little bit about what that means? Cause that's something that I think most people listening aren't right. familiar with. Right. Um, this spawned from the shamanism and, um, mm -hmm. when you go into a space, any space, um, not outer space, but if you, you're in a three dimensional, like right now I'm in a kitchen, mm -hmm. every space has got its own set of rules. You walk into a dojo, a dojo has got its set of rules and, and when you, inner space, you can then change that space. Adding music to a dojo will completely change the space. Mm -hmm. um, your presence and who you are stepping in and your energy levels will change the space. Mm -hmm. So there's this constant connection with everything around you and how you enter a place and how you react to whatever is being presented to you can dictate the way things are going to go. A lot of times, early stages in martial arts, you feel like you're in some sort of, I'm not going to say victim mode, but that you're you are dependent on what's being thrown at you. And if you are in a physical confrontation, yes, you do need to fight back. I'm not going to say there's some woo woo way around a fight or to not fight, but there are so many things you can do prior to a physical confrontation that can dispel any sort of tension. And so as a mental exercise, um, for me, it's, it's, it's mostly mental in that when I feel something come up in myself that, has some sort of uh, feeling of tension at all. Um, I, I'm able to disperse it. And by me dispersing it, it will also, whoever's around me, will also, it will also come or I'll crack a joke or mm -hmm. there will be ways to keep the harmony of everything smooth so that you no longer ever get into the possibility of there being a conflict. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you know, then you're always safe. And if you also follow a path of truth and you're always telling the truth, um, truth has its own level of protection that just, you can be walking down a, a very dangerous street and somehow you will be okay. I'm not advocating to just go do that just to see if it works, but I'm just telling you life will work its way around you in a way and you can be in a maelstrom and you'll be all right. And so that's what I'm speaking about when I'm saying mental things. It's it's um it's equally as important to train and cleanse your mind as it is your body. So after you're done training your body, you know how to take care of yourself in a fight. It doesn't mean that you're the best fighter of all time, but that you are ready to, for the next level. And, and that, then it becomes, becomes mental for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I do my basics, right. But I'm not gonna, you know, go do a three hour, you know, uh, every single technique I know just sure just to stay in shape, you know, like it's, it's, it's more about enjoying life and, um, sharing with others. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get it. And, you know, it sounds like you're philosophically coming 
more out of a, a Chinese tradition. And, mm. you know, and we've talked about this on the show. What does the word Kung Fu mean? It, it doesn't mean doing this set of techniques. It's not specifically a style. It is mastery. When, um, when I had, I believe it was Jonathan Bluestein on the show who actually just wrote another book. He just sent me a book. Shout out to Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, I think we started our, it was like 20 minutes of our conversation I was talking about him gardening. And that yeah. was Kung Fu mm -hmm. as he sees it, right? It, it, you get really good at something and there's a lot of carryover in how you approach it. If you, if you become really good as a martial artist, you can become good at anything. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you learn the fundamental, uh, I don't know if you call it a technique or, or a self-belief or what it is that allows you to continue to persevere through any adversity yeah. and then your own drive and, and your love for whatever, you just become hyper-focused. And I think focus is a big part of it. Um, mm -hmm. Today's generation is on TikTok, on you know, Facebook, and they're getting... I get hooked into it too. Those reels, you just watch them and you watch them and you watch them and your, your focus is, is, but if you can learn to focus and then you can stretch that focus and then stretch that focus and you can hold it for a year, imagine what you can accomplish in a year. Mm -hmm. If you just are focused on one thing, you know, and, um, that's, that's, uh, that's where it's at. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We're going to start to wind down here, but b before we do, uh, Let's make sure we hit all the, all the stuff, websites, links, social media, email, sure. any of that stuff that you want the audience to have. Yeah. Um, please check out uh, whitetigerlegend.com. You can see uh, the in progress trailer, how much we've done so far. There's also a link to the book. Um, I also have another website. Um, you just mentioned the gardening, uh, Immortalite, I-M-M-O-R-T-A-L-I-T-E. It's a French pronunciation of immortality. Okay. And it's based off of Chinese herbs that um, have been incorporated into a product that extends your life. Mm. Um, I learned some of this stuff in the mountains of Guizhou, China. Um, and we're also competing in a $100 million X Prize health span competition. So it's not Elon Musk, but it's close. Um, and uh, yeah, the products in that are, are making people younger. So you're feeling better, you're looking better, you're anti aging. And, well, uh, I. I... That's a Without whole other rabbit. I assume you're taking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, if I did my math correctly, yeah. you're my age or older. I'm 45. Mm, yes, but biologically, I'm somewhere around 34 um, from DNA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, if and folks watching are seeing that it was, mm. you know, I when you when you said you saw. Karate Kid in the original Karate Kid in theaters, I said, okay, this guy's older than he looks hmm. for sure. So, I mean, there, there's a testimonial yeah. to you right to you right there. I'm going to have to check this stuff out. Right on, right on. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's Chinese medicine. So the path, um, people sometimes say, you know, why should I go into a school and start martial arts? You don't know how it's going to come out. Here I am working on longevity and, and, and filmmaking and it was right. all from a bunch of punches and kicks. And um, yeah, so just get in there and start, you know, like you don't know how, what you're capable of or how much you can give to this world if you just give yourself a chance. And, and um, I'm sorry, I've got to step on your toes because that would have been the perfect way to close out, but I, do, I just right. need to <laughs> mention. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, throw it back to you in a minute maybe you, you want to, you want to think about how to extend that or, or maybe take it in a whole different direction as, as we wrap. But I do want to thank the audience for hanging with us. This has been a lot of fun. Check out those websites, check out that book. Uh, I'm, I'm already on pins and needles for that movie without having even watched the trailer yet, but you better believe it's the first thing I'm doing when we get off this recording and shout out to Kataro for their support of this episode and so much of what we do. Use the code WK10 at Kataro.com, K-A-T-A-A-R-O. But yeah, Corey, this has been phenomenal. So how how are we going to close up? How do we put a no bow idea. on this thing? Yeah. How did how did we even get here? I mean, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. 
It's, it's a question I think most of us could ask at any given time in our lives and go, wow, this was quite the ride. And this was quite the ride. We went everywhere. And that's one of my favorite things about the show. You know, here we are just about 10 years in, just about a thousand episodes. And I still love doing this because we, we start, we always start in a fairly predictable way. Who are you? Where are you? What have you trained? Why did you start training? And over the course of 45 to 60 minutes, we always end up someplace dramatically different from every other episode. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for, yeah, for sharing you. all this with everyone.